Well, thank you. Good morning. And while I connect this, just let me let me ask you something. Are there any fans of the uh, British comedy show, The IT Crowd, in the room? Yes. Perfect. All right. That means that this is probably not going to work, which it doesn't. Ah, there it is. Thank you so much. Because I was going to ask you, what would the IT support at the IT crowd recommend in these cases? To turn it off and then on again, of course. Now, I have been developing software for quite some time, almost going on, on three decades. And the principles, they all remain the same, fortunately. What I'm going to talk to you about today is, of course, about coroutines, how to tread lightly. And the first question related to the talk is, who has been using coroutines daily on their, their work? Please, show of hands. All right, so there are enough people who didn't raise their hands so that I will not be ashamed here today. Thank you so much. Now, just a refresher, all right, terminology. So when we write programs, we have sequential flows, you know, things happen one after the other. We have parallel flows and we have concurrent flows. There is a very subtle yet important difference between them. Now, sequentially, in some countries when you want to take a bus, you make an ordered line. In other countries, you don't. <laughs> and when it comes to parallel flows, it is meant when two things or more things are happening at the same point in time. Concurrent flows, on the other hand, are not working at the same point in time, but they are sharing a resource. Quite often in our programs, we'd see a mix of the two. And if you want a uh, more you know, hands-on example, that's probably what's going to happen over lunch. I suppose there's going to be some sort of parallelism, but essentially it's going to be a highly concurrent uh, moment. Uh, therefore, my recommendation is don't all try to grab a sandwich at the exact same moment in time. That will almost certainly result in starvation. That being said, threads enjoy running. That's a, a mnemonic I found many years ago. Because, you know, uh, when, when you create and you start a thread, it just goes. It runs. From our perspective, it just runs until the program ends. And the only way for CPU time to be given to the other thousands of threads in the operating system is by having the operating system scheduler suspending and starting threads. So that this is preemptive multitasking. The code we write is completely unaware that it is going to be suspended and restarted at any given moment in time. This also means that each thread is a stateful instance in itself. There is state associated with that thread. On the other hand, coroutines are quite interesting because the mnemonic I found is that they enjoy sharing. They cooperate. Now, cooperative multitasking is an interesting endeavor because that means that the code we write needs to be aware that it needs to yield to other code in the program. By yielding, that means the coroutine is also suspended. And of course, that means that coroutines are also an example of stateful instances. Now, we will be uh, coming back to uh, cooperative uh, multitasking in a moment. And another important detail is that coroutines, generally speaking, they are um, an example of concurrent programming. If we, the difference in pseudocode is that if we write your normal producer and consumer pseudocode using threads, you can 
do something like this, right? Two infinite loops, one produces the other, consumes, done. We have a shared resource, which is the queue, nothing special. If we try to emulate something that might look like the way of working of a coroutine, which is kind of a special case for a subroutine, by the way, you would have to add a, 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 a specific yield moment. Otherwise, the other one, regardless of which one was started first, the other one would never have time to run. I am going to show some code. Um, that code is available at this repository at GitHub. You will find, find more examples there because this code was uh, initially uh, meant for a, a, a larger session. But we are going to, to focus in a few specific aspects and everything is available at the uh, repository. Now, the first uh, thing that is on people's minds, especially when we compare threads and coroutines, is cost. Is there a difference in cost, and by that I mean computational cost, between threads and coroutines? Well, I, as I am pretty much aware that most of us know, when in a program we create a thread, that thread is usually representative of a operating system threads. That operating system thread, in turn, needs to run on top of a hardware thread. And hardware threads are extremely limited, maybe depending on, on, on the specific processor and its implementation. Nowadays, we may have, what, 16, 32, 64 hardware threads, which are manifestly insufficient to run all the thousands of threads in the operating system at once. And that means that besides using up memory for the shared uh, state, for example, the, the, the call stack, they also require kernel resources to uh, be used. And it is guaranteed that switching from one thread to the other, even though our code is unaware of it, will require a context switching operation. Now, a context switching operation in this context is an expensive operation because that requires that this all uh, the, 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 the CPU registers, all the addressing, all the instruction pointers, everything is stored uh, before it, is, it switches to another uh, software thread, restored and continues execution. And because everything is shared on top of it, on certain situations, the CPU even needs to switch modes, for example, from protected mode to user mode, and that's even more expensive. Coroutines, on the other hand, are entirely a software construct. And of course, we know that every single program requires hardware threads to run on eventually. That's why I s wrote that context switching is not mandatory. But from a conceptual point of view, there is no context switching at going on at all. Because coroutines are cooperative, and in the pseudocode I, I, I have shown earlier, there were two yielding points. In coroutines in Kotlin, in general, there are suspension points, which can be, for example, a call, an explicit call to yield. Uh, a call to a delay operation, which you are going to see a lot in the examples. It's the easiest way to, uh, to simulate long-running operations. Or a point in code where another coroutine is being called. Now, that being said, coroutines can be concurrent by nature, but also we can write code that is explicitly concurrent, meaning that we write code with the intent of having more than one operation occurring in which for us appears to be at the same time, but for the computer, instead it is a, a concurrent operation. Kotlin has fortunately a, uh, a function, the async function, which uh, returns an instance of an object representing a deferred operation, which allows us to conceptually start it, not worry about it, it's going to complete 
somewhere later and only continue executing our code and then at a given moment in time wait for it. Now, we are at the first point where I'm going to switch to IntelliJ and it is at this point that we demonstrate how that works. Now, even though uh, some of you have not used coroutines uh, daily, you probably already read something about it and you recognize the construction. Uh, to provide a coroutine context, we use the hand blocking uh, function at the entry point. And what we are going to do is to call a web service, which is uh, by itself a um, lengthy operation, which is therefore very suitable for uh, usage in this context. And we are going to obtain the translation of hello in four different uh, languages. Now, this is, uh, for the sake of an example, it's using the, the Fuel library, which um, supports coroutines. And uh, this IDE is quite nice. It already shows us which are the potential suspension points for our coroutine, which means that in all of these uh, places where you see the little arrow to the left, that's a susp uh, suspension point. And when we run it, assuming that the uh, network connection is working, we will have the four translations. It takes about a second and a half. And one thing that you may ask yourself, I mean, does it really make much of a difference? Well, this, uh, this server is not that slow, which means that it will not make much of a difference. But if we would like to run these uh, four queries to the web service, one after the other, then of course all we have to do is to remove not only the async uh, method call, but also the await, because now we do not have an instance of deferred, now we have the actual value instead. And once it compiles, we can see that it still works, thankfully, but now it just took longer. And still on the topic of time, just to demonstrate the uh, potential advantages of a coroutine, which is kind of a software thread versus a hardware thread, there is this nice uh, little uh, piece of code, which is going to uh, launch 100,000 coroutines. And of course, we expect it to work, right? And it did. It just launched 100,000 uh, coroutines and completed in a second or so. Now you may ask, what if instead of a um, coroutine, I would just of course it was the wrong import um, who bets that this is not going to work a lot of people are not convinced. So, let's see who won the bet after I remove the wrong imports. <laughs> well, it's still going. and it's still going. Now, the thing about software and, and hardware threads, and uh, now it finished. And it succeeded. 
get, to be honest, I am just as surprised as you are. <laughs> because, <laughs> no, seriously, because um, macOS is one of those uh, operating systems which does have limits to how many uh, threads, how many software threads you can create. And other operating systems, <coughs> Windows, will uh, mostly allow you to create a as many threads as you want, and it will just continue to allow you to create threads until you bring the operating system down to its knees. Linux and Linux-like usually have hard limits. What I was expecting to see, and that's what happened on pretty much all the times I tried this code, was for it to fail with an, an exception around at the 10,000 thread mark, give or take. It would just fail, throw an out of uh, memory exception and print a diagnostic message saying that pthread creation had failed. Well, as with everything, your mileage may vary. But anyway, this was how to you know show that Coroutines can also be uh, explicitly concurrent. And we can say, OK, I, I, I expect these coroutines to run asynchronously. But then, from a, you know, a, a, a conceptual perspective, now we have a number of tasks that are executing independently of each other. And that's all fine. However, if they are linked together, which they usually are, and we want to ensure that they all complete successfully, otherwise we cannot continue, then we need to add some error management and cancellation logic to it. Has, has anyone tried to write cancellation logic with, with completable futures, or even worse, with the futures, where you, if one thread fails, you want to cancel the other one? Uh, did anyone try? Yeah, yeah, you did. Uh, okay. I feel sorry for you. I've 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 done that as well, but thankfully, uh, Kotlin does have a, a structure that allows us to, you know, just express it and handle it in a much simpler way. That's a structured concurrency, where we use something called a coroutine scope to. Um, get all the operations together, there you go, in the same scope, and then when an exception occurs, the runtime is going to take care of all the cancellation logic for us. This is a, a piece of code that is quite simple. It has two async tasks, and at the end, it, it prints the result. Nothing uh, special within the same coroutine scope. And if we just run it, then it just says that it is trying to find the answer to the most important question in the universe. It computes it, turns out it's 43. The code is quite simple, but now let's imagine that we have an exception while computing the question to be asked in order to get the answer. You will, know, I, you, will, you will notice, I'm calling your attention to the fact that both uh, coroutines have a print line right before returning. And at this point, an exception has been thrown. Both coroutines were started. We can see that by the printout. But none of them, them has returned which means that this exception over here has caused this coroutine, this part of the coroutine, not to be executed because it was automatically cancelled by the runtime. This construct is, fortunately, transparent to exceptions, which means that the exception that was thrown in this Coroutine in coroutine 2 has been propagated through the async construct, propagated outside of the coroutine scope, and eventually caught in this well, very generic uh, catch block I have outside. Now, the demonstration serves 
to show that it becomes a lot easier to manage execution of async tasks which are codependent and may need to be uh, correlated. Now, one of the tricky subjects I like, thread affinity. Con from, from, from a conceptual point of view, in my opinion, again, opinions may differ, I like to see a, that a, to look at the program using coroutines as if it was single-threaded. Because execution goes one way, it reaches a suspension point, and at that point, something else is going to be executed until that one suspends and continues, and so on and so forth, and eventually we will get back to uh, the point where we suspended. If anyone in the room has written uh, software for microcontrollers using C years ago, before they were powerful enough to run any real-time uh, operating system, you have probably built a version of this using switch statements, which was a really cool trick. But nowadays, thankfully, life is easier. But, and as far as thread affinity with coroutines is concerned, in practice, with Kotlin, it depends. It depends on what, it depends on which dispatcher it is, is, go, is being used. We will see uh, an example in a moment, which means that my recommendation is to think of a program using coroutines as being free-threaded. We will get back to this uh, definition in a moment. And basically what we are now going to see is what is the effect of uh, specifying dispatchers in thread affinity. Now, again, we have an extremely simple piece of code. The only thing it does is to uh, uh, start uh, 10 coroutines and log before, it, before the delay and after the delay. So when it starts and when it ends. This is your usual log line, and you can see that in this case, without specifying any parameters whatsoever, everything runs on the main thread. There is absolutely zero multi-threading at play here, and yet all the coroutines were uh, started, all of them delayed, and all of them uh, completed in the same thread. So it as concurrent as it gets. Now, if I, um, if I define the de default uh, dispatcher, for example, what will be the difference? Now we have thread names. So the default dispatcher is going to use an underlying executor service. If I remember correctly, by default, uh, the size of the executor service is the same size of uh, is the same number of cores that you have on your machine, and it's going to use those threads to start the co to run the coroutines. But there is no thread affinity, so let me just pick a random example. Coroutine number four has started on worker thread number six. Let's try to see if we find the after delay in four. There we go. It started in thread number six and completed in thread number eight. Now, this means that the code itself, as you can see, has no control whatsoever on which thread it is being executed on. Now, there are other defaults, uh, sorry, other <laughs> dispatchers. Um, the unconfined, for example, has a different behavior. The unconfined is going to start executing the coroutine on the same thread it is currently running until the first suspension point, and then the coroutines will continue execution after the first suspension point in uh, the Kotlin X uh, default executor, which is a, a single-threaded executor. Are we limited? There are other uh, dispatchers. 
if we uh, look at the dispatchers that are available, we have the main dispatcher, which is usually implemented in the Android platform. It's commonly used to run uh, code in the UI thread. And we also have the IO uh, dispatcher, which in this specific platform also uses the default dispatcher. However, other implementations may use a dispatcher which is meant specifically for IO operations. And we can even, if we want, use just you know an, a, a, any uh, uh, executor service taking advantage of the Kotlin extension uh, methods to use also an executor as a coroutine uh, dispatcher. I'm not going to run this code because it will hang. Uh, the executor needs to be uh, shut down. But the point I'm trying to, um, to make is we have used either in the hand blocking uh, function or in the launch uh, function, we can also specify a dispatcher. There are several places where we can specify a dispatcher. We have specified the dispatcher that's going to use to run the coroutines. The code itself does not know on which thread it is running at which moment in time. This is a free threaded model. And if the same function may run on different threads at different moments in time during its execution, then the question uh, it can be asked. If we are changing threads during our execution, can we rely on the traditional thread synchronization mechanisms? That's a question for the audience, because I know that everybody's getting hungry. Can, can, can we use your normal JRE synchronization mechanism? Can, can, can we use the synchronized keyword, for example, in some data object? Does it work? Well, we can use it, of course, but it's not going to work. Or well, at least not how we expect it to. Because the traditional thread synchronization mechanisms, they all assume that the thread that acquired the lock is the, the same one that's going to release it. Which is not necessarily the case with coroutines. Consequences can be diverse, meaning um, eventually a thread may end up deadlocked. Uh, there may be an exception. The resource may be used concurrently without any kind of memory back here. And this is a problem. And you may ask, then, how do we solve the problem of coroutines accessing shared state or shared resources? Well, obviously, the first solution is don't share. Be selfish, share nothing, keep it all to yourself. That's not always possible, of course. One potential uh, solution is to use dispatchers so that you have control over which thread the coroutine is running. So for example, you can use a, a single threaded uh, dispatcher. Or you can use Objects, synchronization objects that have been designed explicitly to be used with coroutines, such as, for example, the Kotlin X uh, Mutex. This one is coroutine safe and it is going to use to, to, to work properly. The uh, other suggestion for sending data back and forth between uh, coroutines is to use channels. Uh, we do not have time to go over this today. But channels are uh, communication uh, primitives, which, well, as the name implies, it, you build a communication channel between coroutines, and then you have coroutines passing messages to each other. There is a very useful pattern, which is the generator. Now, the generator is a, a, is a coroutine. It's, it's, it's a special case. It has a couple of constraints. 
unlike the other coroutines, it yields to no one else but its caller, and it will only yield to produce a value. That's why it's called a generator. Generators in, in Kotlin are implemented using flows, and they are quite simple. We have a method called flow to build a flow. Inside that flow, we emit values, and the caller of the flow needs to collect them. Now, this kind of construct, for those who are uh, familiar with Java, for example, or reactive programming, it looks a lot like a stream. It smells like a stream. It sounds like a stream, which means that conceptually it is a stream. Not only they are data streams, but they are also cold, meaning that you need to, act to run the uh, terminal operation for the stream to start working. In a coroutine context, they only suspend when the generator suspends. And just like all the other three streams, there are intermediate operations. And they, being called, they are going to complete when they run out of data. They are also transparent to exceptions, which means that we can use a construct like we did with structured uh, concurrency. And any exception thrown inside uh, the uh, generator is going to be propagated throughout the chain to its, uh, to its color before we get to any uh, real world example. Let's take a look at the flow. Now, in this case, this example is going to grab a quote from a web service. Why uh, uh, web service operations? Well, because we know those take a long time in computer time. That's an eternity. And they are a perfect candidate for a, an operation that suspends. We'll get, I'll get to that in a moment. We have our flow. The flow is going to call the web service 10 times to get a random quote. And the main function is just going to collect data which is emitted from the flow. Nothing, uh, nothing special. Because the API is limited, we need to wait a bit between them. But anyway, the point is that it does what it says on the label. It repeats, it calls a, a, a web service, and then emit, whoops and then emits the value that was returned from that web service. It is a flow, nothing special. The usual example um, has a for loop and emits numbers 1 to 10. Here we, uh, we go and grab a few quotes. Now, all the examples so, so far have shown web calls. And I started this uh, conversation talking about cooperation between coroutines. It turns out that not all kinds of operations suit the coroutine model the best. This IO, IO in general, takes an eternity, as far as the processor is concerned, is perfect. Computational um, heavy operations, well, that's a, different, that's a different thing. I'm going to run an example. This example uses uh, the uh, Leibniz approximation, sorry, to calculate pi up to 9 or 10 digits, uh, give or take, which, as you can uh, imagine, is a CPU-intensive operation. The algorithm, uh, it, it, it 
this is the algorithm which you, you have uh, on your uh, screen. It is meant to be repeated. It loops. It uh, accumulates uh, results in an accumulator. And eventually, it will uh, return the, the approximation. Now, this code is going to run the calculation in three ways. It's going to run it, well, linearly, just start and wait until it finishes. It's going to use threads to, to, to segment the, segment the, 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 the calculation, run those segments in parallel, and then combine them at the end. So you know, your typical divide and conquer algorithm. And then it's going to do the same thing, but using coroutines. It warms up. Done. Now, the linear calculation took approximately 1.2 seconds. Splitting it into a number of threads, four, if I remember correctly, took uh, 182 milliseconds, which is 10% of the value. The version with coroutines took a second and a half. It, took, it was even longer. It took longer than if we had not uh, taken the trouble of splitting it. And I should also mention that this code, as you can see by the log lines, the coroutines code, which is the last part, it runs on the main thread, so meaning no dispatcher was specified. This is strictly single threaded. Because it is single threaded, do you remember that conversation earlier about cooperation, meaning that the coroutine needs to explicitly yield to others? If it is running on the single thread, now on a single thread we have, if I remember, four coroutines, uh, iterations, actually we have 10. But we, if, if we have 10 coroutines running on a dispatcher which uses the same thread, then that means it's going to run one segment of one coroutine, then this another segment of the second, and so on and so forth, one after the other, until they all finish. Which means that not only we have the same execution model as the single-threaded one, but because, we, because this is a CPU heavy operation, meaning that there, there are no suspension points, and I just added an explicit call to yield here only to get the suspension point, they are not allowing the other coroutines to work. But the code itself knows nothing about this, right? There, it doesn't know. It's about the context in which it is called, which is why if we specify the um, default dispatcher, for example, then we have comparable results. Because now we specify the dispatcher, which is multi-threaded. And that means that the dispatcher itself can run those coroutines in parallel. Now, what's the point I'm trying to drive home here? The point I'm trying to drive home is that even though coroutines are, and please don't get me wrong, coroutines are a wonderful language feature, some scenarios are just either unsuitable for a coroutine, such as a CPU-heavy calculation, or they require care to be taken into knowing, OK, these coroutines need to be executed with a specific kind of dispatcher. Otherwise, we will not get the uh, performance increase we would expect from it, which is, well, why sometimes evaluating performance with, with coroutines is, can, be, can be tricky. Just like with threads, by the way. Same thing. Now, 
real world. At ING, we do use a lot of Spring. And Spring already, thankfully, already allows us to use coroutines in uh, web applications. Both stacks, both main stacks do. Uh, both the Spring MVC and the Spring Web Flux will allow us to uh, run coroutines. And also, just like with threads, where the advice is always do not block the thread, because of what we have just seen, th that advice becomes even more relevant. Do not block your coroutine. Coroutine compatible or non-blocking versions of HTTP clients, database connectors, etc., etc., are a must. So either we wrap them in some concurrent or parallel framework, or we uh, leverage the ones that exist. The example I have of a uh, Spring controller. Now, this is a, 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 a Spring MVC Hello World application. And this is your normal REST controller. How is it different from the others in, in Kotlin? Well, you have the suspend keyword. And by adding the suspend keyword, then Spring does its magic. It looks, you know, reflection, looks at this, oh, this is a coroutine. The uh, appropriate dependencies are in place, the coroutine score and the coroutine reactor. And by having them in place, magic happens. And when the controller is executed, it is executed in a coroutine context. And from that moment on, everything else applies and runs inside a coroutine context. This, um, this application, well, it is your normal spring. Notice, well, it hasn't started yet. Let me just... Uh, let me just... Uh, what was the key combination again? The problem during a presentation when you are in present mode is that you need to absolutely remember all the possible combinations. And when you have a short keyboard as this one, all the combinations are a pain. But anyway, I have just called my local service. And the local service went to the same web service as before to fetch a number of quotes. The quotes are fetched using the Java HTTP uh, client, which is asynchronous, and there are a number of extension uh, functions which allow us to uh, connect it nicely to uh, Coroutine's context. And then we emit all those uh, functions. So we are wrapping it into a flow. That flow. will be subject to a map operation just to extract the quote because the API response has more attributes we are not interested in. And this is also a, an interesting uh, feature in Spring, which is that this uh, controller method returns the flow itself. Uh, you will notice that it does not collect the results. Spring will, later on, start collecting them and sending them to the browser managing it as it, uh, as it uh, sees fit. The other interesting feature is that even though we are running our controller using coroutines, we are still, this is still Spring MVC, we are still inside a servlet um, context, which means that all your servlet definitions are available, your filters are there, they are not going to be coroutines, but they are there, they can be used, and you can start to uh, migrate your application to a, a coroutine-based one, as you wish. <coughs> 
The same uh, concerns regarding dispatchers apply. Spring is going to use the, uh, uh, an unconfined dispatcher, which means that the controller code is going to run initially on the same HTTP server thread, and at the first suspension point, it is going to switch to a different thread, the default uh, executor one, which means, again, all the caveats apply. I hope that you have enjoyed this very fast, very dense overview of, uh, of coroutines in Kotlin and Spring. All the code is in the repository that I mentioned earlier. We are right on time, which means that we, we do not have the time for questions. But if you do want to ask anything, just I will be all out there with you, trying to get lunch concurrently. <laughs> Hopefully not being suspended in the process, uh, which means that uh, we can grab a, a sandwich and a chat. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>